Um, there we go. Welcome to Teacher Seeking Teachers. And we have a few people here at an earlier time than usual. Um, thank you for making this happen. Um, let's do quick introductions, uh, what you're thinking and who you are, what you're thinking, what you're doing these days around AI. Nikki, do you want to start us off? You've been you've been uh, away for a while. Welcome I back. have been. I have been. Um, so, yeah, the 8 o'clock time rather than the 9 o'clock time was very appealing, actually. Um, so um, I'm Nikki Fain, and I work at Lehman College. And I work with um, teacher residents. And um, I am now grappling with the issue of an AI policy in terms of what you put in your syllabus. Well, oh, cool. Scott, welcome. You can introduce yourself second if you unmute. <laughs> there you go. Hey, glad to be glad to be back. It's been a couple a couple weeks. Um, so my name is Scott Christensen. Um, a, uh, I'm an ELA specialist in uh, Utah. I work for a large school district here. Um, and I was introduced to the group uh, by Chris Sloan. And I've really loved what I've been able to see. And when I get to read the emails that say we're having a meeting, and then someone else decides to throw a meeting at the same time. And I'm like, ah! So. <laughs> cool, cool. What Glad are you here. doing in your district these days around AI? AI, yeah, actually, so um, I just got an email yesterday from um, at the state level. They want me to help design a micro credential on uh, ways to use AI in classrooms um, and kind of building a stack around that. Um, I don't know the extent of where they want to go yet because we haven't had our first meeting. Um, I've also done, I mean, we haven't gone as far as, as um, you know, like Chris has done with with his students, but is we're still kind of breaking down that wall. But I think we're finally getting there. I think uh, last week I shared with my teachers um, what what is it the magic AI? You guys know what I'm talking the magic web or magic? Oh yeah, anyway, yeah. Mag magic yeah. box or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and what Chris hooked them was it, that yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, there's a spot in there where you can write in how you really feel, and then it turns it into a beautiful letter that you can send home to parents. And so. I was like, okay, if you're feeling grumpy, here, use this, and then it'll, you know, they all jump in on that. So, anyway, just just trying to get it out there, get our teachers to realize it's not an evil, um, and that it can be a really useful tool for kids. <laughs> cool, cool. Thanks for joining us, Andrea. Yep. Okay, hi. Um, <laughs> I'm so excited. It's Magic School AI. I love Magic School AI. They have so many fun little tools in there. I just think they're being so creative. And also like the FERPA compliance part, it's just like helping teachers remember, like don't put things in here. I've been doing a ton of weird things with AI. So I'm like working with schools around our state and county about their AI policies or just exploring it. We've been working with Amanda Fox who wrote the AI classroom. Um, she's been coming into some schools in Michigan. We've had a series of, they've been calling them like AI summits to bring together people in different um, capacities to explore AI with teachers. And this, I've been singing the praises of youth voices. So I've been trying to get uh, teachers to see some of the AI experiments and what you're doing with Now Comment and whatnot and trying to spread the word about it. And then the weirdest thing personally that I just did was my good friend Lee Graves Wolf, who's friends with Chris Sloan in here. Um, she was a special editor for the Irish Journal of Technology Enhanced Learning. And they did a call for proposals where you were writing a scholarly article with AI. So they had this like beautiful thing where you wrote a reflection and then you, mm -hmm built out like a whole scholarly article based on the call and then you reflected on it and that's getting published next week and they did it in 80 days from call through the whole peer review process to publication and I'm so pumped to be a part of that so that's coming out next week so I'm excited I'm excited <laughs> just it was so I got to review some the of the others you. and they cool. were so good oh yeah I've been doing a lot with it a lot with it trying to figure out like everything from how do you make project-based learning planning go easier with like 
different AI tools to what do our policies and our syllabi look like to what does it look like to be a scholar with AI in these spaces. So it's been fun. David, do you want to introduce yourself? Strictly briefly. Hi. Yeah, yeah. My name is David Cole. I'm based in Berkeley, California. I uh, had the pleasure of working with the writing project on tech related literacy projects over the years. And this is one more example of that. It's fun to be here with you all. Bob? Hi, I'm Bob Montgomery. I work at WestEd and I'm excited to be here with you all learning um, about ways AI can support our individual and collective growth. Uh, and I'm waiting for Jill last because we're going to look at some of her students work. Um, but so Nick, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Nick Cuyos. I'm located just outside New York City in Westchester County, um, where I was a department chair there for a long time and now I'm retired. And I'm working with Paul on developing a writing tool that uses AI to help students with feedback. Richard, welcome. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, sure. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. So um, I'm Richard. Uh, pleased to be here. I, I came once before a long time ago. It was pre-COVID. And I'm here again because I'm interested in the topic that you're discussing tonight. Uh, I teach at Brooklyn Tech in New York City and um, am, am imagining uh, how AI could be used as a kind of chat buddy. Um, yeah. What have you done around that? Well, actually nothing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, had, uh, we had a little powwow when ChatGPT first came out. Um, I guess it was in in June of last year of of this year, uh, the previous academic year, but this one, and um, nothing came of that. Uh, and so, you know, I've been using ChatGPT occasionally for my own purposes. Um, mm -hmm. um, my son actually also uses it. He's a high school student. And he uses it as an enhanced Google, uh, an enhanced search engine, um, to which I thought was interesting because I had never conceived of it that way. Um, mm -hmm. And I think also it would be interesting to have, you know, ChatGPT or um, GPT-4, if you're going to pay for it, um, you know, right there in the group and students can refer to it and interact with it. Uh, I, I wonder what the possibilities of that might be. Cool, cool. What do you teach, Richard? I teach AP Seminar, um, which is a capstone class. And then I teach English 11 or American Lit. Cool, cool. Welcome, welcome. Um, this is very informal. We just sort of get here and, and talk to each other. And um, I did ask Jill to uh, be able to, well, Jill, introduce yourself briefly, and then we'll try to look at what you've been messing around with since, what, Tuesday or something? <laughs> very, this is maybe Monday. Monday. Yeah. Yep. Uh, this is very fresh. We're just sort of um, jumping in, but it's kind of amazing how fast your kids have taken off with it. But introduce yourself a bit first, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Jill Stadronsky. I'm an eighth grade language arts teacher in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. I'm also a consultant for the National Writing Project, and I work with uh, Drew University and uh, teach there for their pre-service teachers. And my kids have been playing around on Youth Voices and in Now Comment. Cool. Uh, anybody want to ask anybody any questions before we <laughs> thoughts? All right. Let me let me keep going um, a little bit. I I um, so the the on the table. If you can see the table, and by the way, the plus and minus key on your keyboard get it zooms you in and out. Um, that may be useful to you at some point here. Um, but there is a pie chart. I guess it is um, that comes from a project with the with Penn and with. The National Writing Project. Um, there, are some of the many of the teachers who are using Now Comment in Philadelphia are in that project. It's a digital discourse project, um, and 
together they've thought about where do English teachers use digital discourse, right? And um, and so they came up with these categories of social exchange, social making, and social annotating. Um, don't want to just I just want to kind of put that out there, and just say that part of the questioning the question last week in my very <laughs> um, half-assed, if I can say that, presentation of, of what we're trying to do here. Um, people were asking about this. But so there are GPT thinking partners on Now Comment that support kids, um, engage kids, push kids to think about their writing. Um, there are other GPTs that do that for their reading. And now what we've started to think about is could we use those same GPT thinking partners without any text, right? So that um, they're just chatting with each other. And Jill had a project. Um, maybe, um, Jill, do you want to present or should I present? And we think we haven't um, planned this as usual. Well, you know, but, right. One of the things I have access to is in their book thought journal, because we're still really in the process of this. And let me just mm -hmm. maybe just set it up for two minutes. My kids mm -hmm. keep book thought journals. My entire class is kind of uh, based on finding your curiosities in life. I do teach ELA, language arts, uh, eighth grade, but I've kind of created my own cur curriculum and in my district, they've um, reluctantly let me do it because <laughs> I keep pushing forward. So my kids have four different journals. One of them is called the book thought journal. And every time they read something, they're asked to put down passages or pages and what is it making them think about? How is your book sparking uh, ideas or thoughts? How is it making you think about yourself, the world? So what we did was on Youth Voices and Now Comment, I don't know if a bunch of you are familiar with Now Comment, uh, if you've worked with it through the National Writing Project or anything, but my students took um, their entire book thought journal and I'll just share my screen for a second. Let's see if it works. Hold on. Okay. So this is what, can everybody see? Yep. Yeah. Okay. This is what, let me just move everybody. And by here. the way, there is, a, there is a, a magnifying glass in the top right corner that okay. lets you get no, not you, but other. everybody can make it bigger themselves. Yeah. Okay. But go ahead. Yeah. So this is just what the book thought journal looks like at uh, different times after we read uh, several days in a row, then they track some thoughts so they can have different books in here, different passages, and they have different lengths of thoughts. And my goal is always to try to be stretching how they think, not just to stay within the text, but can you go beyond the text? Because it's when we go beyond the text, then we realize how the book helps us think about our own lives, helps us be more empathetic, helps us grow, helps us think about you know world issues and problems. Um, do you want me to show it on uh, now? Comment what happens, or just kind of talk yeah, through? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, right. um, Jill, just so clear. So this is um, look, we're looking at an entry, individual entries. So on the seventeenth our mistake on the 6th of November. So these are just little um, comments and annotation diaries. Yeah, so it's kind of like her thoughts. So like, yeah. you know, here she read Twisted Games. Um, mm -hmm. And we go back to it to kind of expand it. And they all read their own books. They read their own choices. I have my own kind of like library of books. And I book yeah. talk books all the time. I want them to read things. And I just say, I want you to read and think. And, and that books shape um, shape us and yeah. help us decide who we want to come uh, become. So yes, this is one of the girls' book thought journals. And the reason why I also wanted to open it up because we pasted some of our feedback here. Um, but let me let me take you over to no, now comment for a second. Let me get there. Um, and as you're doing that, um, yep. Jill over the week over the weekend, right before she presented this. Um, or after last Wednesday said, hey, I want to do this thing where it pushes their thinking. Um, you, you called it roots and branches. 
Uh, look, right. where's the where are the roots? Where are the branches of of her of the kids thinking in in these journals? Um, do any of the I wanted it to, to do that? Yeah, go ahead. I asked Paul. I said, um, I said, um, sorry, I had to just. I was help, I was I was I was filling in while you did that. But yeah, I asked Paul. I said, "What I really want is what we all want, right? Another seventy people of ourselves, and rather than me just looking at all their book thought journals and having a conversation, I usually like to do it live with them rather than just writing thoughts. Sometimes I do that, but it's time consuming. So I wanted a thinking partner that was going to read all their thoughts in the journal." And then help them, like help find topics and themes um, and also kind of come up with roots and branches of any of those topics and themes. And so Monday when we jumped on, we kind of used, Paul had told, taught me about three of the partners. It was a free thinking partner. One was like an inquiry youth partner mentor. Um, and then there was an English supportive teacher. So we kind of fiddled around with that. And then what we did was Paul had also taught a few of my students how to create their own thinking partner. And we were getting back so much information and it was high level for my eighth graders. And when I was reading it, I went, kind of went around and read a lot of the feedback that it was giving. I thought, wow, this is pretty sophisticated. Um, for some of them, it's too much. And it was just a large amount of text. So I made a thinking partner. And then the next day, um, and I think I can show my thinking partner, right? Sure. Let me get down to do we, do we want to show a little bit about what the what the thinking partners do though before you go there or the ones that that they use? Um uh, uh, up to you. Okay. Yeah, I mean I can I think that's kind of one of those things like you go, you play and you do with it, but. Um, well, go ahead. Is, there, is there anybody in particular that stands out? Um, why don't you go to did? like, um, why don't you go to Sam's or I'm trying okay. to think, go to, uh, I don't, I don't maneuver it as well as you do, Paul. Let me just. So go I'll, I'll jump in and you tell me where to go. Yeah. Um, I, I just went to Sam's. Yeah. Go to Sam's. Um, you, have, you, have to, you have to share. I know. Uh, let me just do it like this. And, you know, just to preface for everybody, this was the first time that we were, we had been playing around with Paul's thinking partners on our writing, but we had never asked it to, you know, this was not where we were looking at, looking for it to change our writing. We were asking it to like think with us about our books and look at our thoughts and then see where it could stretch our thoughts. And so when then um, we tried the three different ones that Paul had suggested and I had played with, and they were, I thought, interesting for me, and they were good for about 10% of my kids. But some of them, it was just too much information. So I created another partner. I mirrored off of something that Paul had done. And then I was very specific. I just said, find roots, um, find branches, make sure that you identify topics and themes and provide three inquiry questions that we could delve into um, in a deeper way and research. And then I also said, provide any out of the box topics, topics that you think might be very loosely related. In the end, one thing that was interesting about that, that it kind of orga organized most of the, their feedback with um, a bolded topics, themes. It had the three questions below. And I could see for the kids, because there was so much feedback, most of them said, I asked them all to respond about the feedback, what they liked or didn't like. Um, they liked that it was organized, but they still felt... I also asked it to write at an eighth grade, use eighth grade vocabulary. And still, even though these were eighth graders and they're really, the majority of the kids Paul has seen, they're really, I, I require them to think and they think pretty high level, but their feedback was still sophisticated. 
it got really into you know some big world questions in psychology and there was language that they couldn't understand and so tomorrow they want to fiddle around with it and try to put in um could we use that same partner but ask the partner to give feedback that really would be at the fifth grade level but everybody did get feedback and i did ask them jill I said, jill yeah i'm sorry i'm really yeah. trying to, you're doing a great job describing but i i have I'd really like to see the prompts and see the student writing. And sure. if you could take, take we're getting a, there. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's take you to, um, I, am I sharing? Right on I am sharing. Right? Right. Here's Shannon. Can I ask a related question while Paul, Paul, are you setting this up right now? Is that what's I thought it was, but go ahead. I don't want to interrupt too much, but if, if now's the time to ask you a logistics question about this, Jill, I'll, I'll do that. Yep. Sure. Yes, go ahead. Um, I'm always curious about the pacing. Like, does are, are kids interacting with this online in class, or are they doing it out of out of your classroom? No. And what's the what's the what's the setting and the pacing or the timing that you use to have kids socialize about it with you or with each other? How does that reflection happen in the classroom? Um, so does it happen? This, sorry, this all happened over two periods. Okay. Um, and I do everything in class. I don't do any homework or anything like that. Okay. So, like you can see on Shannon's, I'll show you up here. Shannon's? Okay. This I have Shannon's up. Can you guys see it? I don't think um, you're sharing. Not yet. All right. Let me make sure I'm sharing. Let me go back. So. Okay. All right, there we go. You see Shannon's now? Uh, Come up. Yep. Okay. So, Joe, let me describe for a minute, and then you can, sure. and then you can go on. Um, so, Shannon took all of all of what she had put in a Google Doc, copied it, and put it into a reply on a on a now comment page. Right. Then yeah. she said. Then she. Who did she go to? She. She then hit reply with AI and asked the supportive English teacher to respond. Does that make some sense? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's hard to read this, but maybe it's worth reading at least the first few paragraphs there. Do you mind, Joe? Okay. It says, so when she tried the supportive English teacher, it says, it's clear that you have delved deeply into the text and unearthed a range of significant themes worthy of further exploration. Now let's consider your observations and how they might translate into compelling inquiry questions. Regarding the Hawthorne legacy, which is the book, you've touched on the impact of wealth and its ability to drastically alter lives and relationships. From the passage you've provided, when I'd inherited, she lost everything. There's an interesting paradox that emerges around the distribution and consequences of wealth. How about framing an inquiry question around this theme? For example, how does sudden wealth affect personal identity and interpersonal relationships in literature and society? In discussing another book, The Final Gambit, uh, the concept of trust, particularly in high stakes situations, stands out. Consider a question like, in what ways does trust influence characters' decision making in suspenseful narratives like The Final Gambit? And okay. then... It said, your reflections on the media roles resonate with contemporary issues as well. An inquiry question might revolve around the influence of the press. How is the relationship between public figures and the press portrayed in literature? And what does this reveal about society's valuation of privacy versus the right to know? And then it goes on a little bit more. And she had put in the question with the English mentor Please find themes and topics that I can research further, analyze them, and help me think of an inquiry question. And then she, keep going a little bit, she she then asked again, right? Yeah, so I did try to teach him what Paul was saying, almost to like look at something else that was narrow in on something specific. So now it said, can you give me more inquiry questions? And the supportive English teacher again said, I love the depth of thought you're putting into these potential questions. 
how about we delve even deeper into them? For instance, we could look at nuances within the theme of wealth in the Hawthorne legacy. Do you think exploring how characters' motives are influenced by wealth would add an interesting dimension? Maybe ask what motivates characters to change in response to wealth, and is this change often for better or worse? Or with the final gamut, examining how the absence or presence of trust impacts a character's moral compass could be quite intriguing. How do these dynamics alter their path, potentially leading to betrayal or redemption? And then she went further down here, staying with the English teacher. And she said, can you tell me the roots and branches of this topic? And it says, the roots of your topic seem deeply embedded in literary analysis, specifically in exploring how different themes influence character development and plot progression. In Hawthorne Legacy, diving into the character's motivations shaped by wealth could indeed add depth as you consider asking, or as you consider asking, what motivates characters to change in response to wealth? And is the change often for better or worse? You are on the cusp of a thought provoking analysis. She also was reading The Stranger in the Lifeboat, and it says, regarding The Stranger in the Lifeboat, you've touched on a multifaceted theme, faith, identifying varied, varying depictions of faith and their survival implications can be rich terrain for your essay. Yo, could you scroll up a little bit so we could just get a scan of what she actually, her first, the, what she wrote originally? <clears throat> yes, um, yes. Yeah, so this is... Over everything in the a blue number of weeks, everything. over a number of weeks, she kept this journal, and then it's reading through that journal and giving her this feedback, right? Um, and I do have to say, ninety percent of the kids, even though at first they didn't want to read as much, you know, what's interesting, I think, is they want one or two lines. Mm -hmm. But when I forced them and I said, "You have to comment about three of the things it said," and I read through all that feedback. 90% of the kids said it offered something I hadn't thought about. Hmm. Hey. This, yeah, this and, is, and just, sorry, go ahead. Bill. Well, I, I think, I mean, to me, this is the most exciting domain when we come to this place about learners getting a chance to, you know, have their work considered or, you know, that where they are in the spotlight, not the text. I just feel the energy goes up so much for the for the learner, and I just gets me so excited to see it used this way to to learn about myself, my work through this relationship um, with AI. It's just very powerful. A couple of little details worth I think worth mentioning is that, and remember, this was what two fifty minute periods, right? Two forty minute <laughs> um, so, periods. Okay, right. So we're not talking about in depth work here. In that. Yeah, um, but at, at every point, at, at every, at the student has the option to reply themselves, so do their own writing within here, within each of these, um, or, to re, or to ask AI, and when they ask AI, they have the option to choose a different partner to get involved in the conversation as well. So that, that and then there's the whole thing of, making their own and, and having that partner get involved in, in the conversation. But so having said that, she at some point went on and did your your partner. Do you want to explain yeah. that a little bit? Yeah. So this one is the bottom one where then I tried to fiddle around with the partner to just see if it would organize things better. Um, and so the Jill's inquiry partner, um, now I tried to give like topics and themes. So if you can see there, it says number one, psychological impact of sudden wealth, roots, psychology of wealth, human adaption to change, social impact of wealth, inequality, economic psychology, branches, sudden wealth syndrome, lottery winner statistics and stories, impact of wealth on family dynamics, the role of financial education in managing new wealth, philanthropic behavior following sudden wealth. The inquiry question it gave to this was, what are the long-term psychological and social consequences for individuals who experience sudden wealth increases, and how do these changes affect their concepts of identity and interpersonal relationships? 
And then like on the one that was the uh, Stranger in the Boat, Mitch Albom's book, it said, it, the, it gave the topics as human relationship with faith and the divine. The roots were origins of religious belief, the psychology of faith, anthropology of religion, comparative religion. The branches were the role of narrative and myth in shaping faith-based beliefs, the concept of secular spirituality, the intersection of faith and science, such as neuro neurotheology, placebo effects in faith and healing, and the phenomenon of atheism and agnost I can't say it. Agnost so how you, yes. Yeah. And then Sorry. the question is, the inquiry question it gave or offered was, in what ways do the needs for explanation, control, and comfort drive human beings to create and adhere to concepts of the divine? And how do these needs manifest across different cultures and historical periods? And the kids that are choosing to read those kind of books in my class, um, like I said, I wish that was easier, right? So we're going to try that tomorrow at a fifth grade rather than we said to <laughs> please speak in eighth grade language. But she had even reported it, it brought up things that we have then an inquiry journal where she's going to now explore some of those ideas um, on her own in her inquiry journal. Uh, I, I, I want to quick sidebar um, and and but related to what you just said about exp about changing the thinking partner. Um, one of Bob, I think you questioned word thinking partner when we had simulators of of the in, in the Israel Hamas war and which were giving these long detailed things. I went back, and we haven't had a chance to look at this, but part of the learning that I'm throwing back to the community and have, have started talking to Nate and Sam, two of Jill's students, um, about is to what, what you can do and what we've started to do is to say, hey, prepare your whole answer, but stop at 150 words, and, and then um, give us a summary of where else you might go. Tell us the three next topics you might go to. And it does that. And then, and, but, and what's interesting about that and what fits a chat, you'll, the one above this one that Shannon's, you'll see, she went to like three chats, but you could go, you could go much further as well. Right. And if you had the time. Yeah, we just, no, know, I know. I'm just, yeah. We just yeah. But part of that is designing yeah. the thinking partner to be something that does that, right? That stops itself at a certain point that says, okay, now I'm going to hear the next three topics I could talk about. Which of those are you interested in? So it centers the, the user again, right? Yeah. So learning how to do that in the is 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 an interesting so it's not just about you know use a use a simpler lexical level right or it's also no. about yeah yeah and you know what paul you did make a good point because this is the first time they've done this for the book thought journal so maybe now that they know about this maybe they would do it differently well nate I, if i <laughs> I, Nate, Nate and Sam and I talk once in a while, but um, Nate immediately took this, this, uh, Joe, you're not talking, are you? Or we can't no. hear you. Okay. Sorry. So he, just as an example, he took this tool and said, you know what? I want, I want it to make an email for me. Right. And I said, what? <laughs> and so he created, he created a, a form with a, using a thinking partner that at, that does an email. I said, what do you need an email for? He said, well, like if I need to talk to my teacher after class, I can just, I can just uh, say, you know, it'll, it'll automatically make that email for me, right? Not, not a bad idea. Um, but he said it, it's much too kind. So we talked about, and um, you know, why is it so kind? We looked at his, we looked at his, uh, 
prompt and it says, <laughs> be very kind when you write this, right? And so his friend, Sam said, why don't you use the word appropriate instead? Use the appropriate language, right? So they were they were wordsmithing this thing and and they end up and looking at the you know examples that they came out. Another one of your students, Jill, these are, and these are just sort of like off <laughs> off the assignment. Um, she put in three topics from her debate class and asked it to do a position paper on on using those three topics, right? So they are like within a day, they are figuring out how they want to use this tool themselves, um, which doesn't take away at all with our using it too, but yeah. So those are some thoughts. Let me let me try to do that here. Can can you direct Jill and me to help make open this conversation up? And Natalia, welcome. By the way, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? There you go. Put you on the spot. You have to unmute. I think. There you go. Natalia teaches in Orange County. Um, is it Orange County? No, it's it's uh, no. It, when you get in, you'll you'll figure it out. So, what thoughts or questions do you want to ask us? And maybe we'll find examples of what we're messing around with here. I'm sort of waiting for you. We're not wait. We're not waiting for Natalia. She'll figure it out and jump in when she can. So, I, I'm curious. Yeah, go what, ahead, please. Any, any evidence of thinking by the students in your initial experience, Jill? Sounds like AI to me. It looks like AI is doing all the work, but maybe <laughs> I, obviously the first time they're using it. But did you see any sparks of students actually having their thinking helped? by the, their partners. Yeah, so afterwards, when they got this feedback, they went back to their book thought journals and I asked them to, you know, tell me what you thought about, you know, they got, can you guys hear me? I, I got a lot of yes, feedback. Yes, yes, we're good. A lot of echo. Natalia, is that you? Joe, I think you're okay. Okay. Um, so, Bob, and let me know if this is not what you're asking, but I did ask them specifically then, like today, tell me what feedback you liked. Did it spark any new thoughts? How is it stretching your thinking? And what, you know, what are some of the questions that you might take to your inquiry journal based on this? They actually on paper today took some of the thoughts and stretched it on paper with their peers, like, Hey, this is what it said, and then they talked it out with peers, thinking, what else would they be fascinated with? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. that, that, that sounds great. I mean, it's just, you're just building the relationship, but it sounds like the initial fascination effect is yielding to some, you know, curiosity and you know, growing in their, on their own, but that it'd be great to see if that could be captured in this environment somehow. Yeah, what do you mean by that? Like, expand that thought. Well, if if Shannon's asking questions and getting roots and branches, it, it would be great if Shannon was re responding to those roots and branches right here. Yes, yes. We just didn't have time for that yet. Exactly. I mean, ultimately, my kids use their journals to build TED Talks, NPR podcasts, um, articles for the New York Times, and that Stossel contest. And so, I'm so uh, I'm so fascinated with them really finding thoughts that they really care about. So everything we read or view, I want them to have their own thoughts. And so, for me, the AI was: could it help them stretch their thoughts? And then when they saw the AI's thoughts, 
see where they could take that, you know, so that they still could connect with it personally and maybe it would find something that they weren't thinking about. Yeah, the idea that maybe one of these roots or one of these branches could become something that the student can reflect on because it's trying to figure out how to create a funnel effect because the funnel keeps opening and opening if you're asking it questions. But if you pick something that you've received and you want to, you know, think about it a little bit and go deeper into that, like that would be something you'd have to drive. The student would have to know how to drive that, but that would be a process this could support. So can you see the new journal that I'm on now? Yes. So what we briefly did, and again, this was just because we don't, we didn't have tons of time in red below. This is so, another so by the way, by the way, one of the things we have to do is change the entire schedule so that you have more time. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So I'm this is Ananya's. This was off of different books, but she actually had read, I think, one of the same books as um, Shannon. So her thoughts are in red below. And it says, it's really interesting how the AI pulled all of this from my passage. It thought of a ton of stuff that I didn't even know you could think of from what I gave it. One question that I thought was really cool was how do wealth and power coalesce to create dynamic networks of influence and what checks and balances are effective in preventing abuse in the systems? Basically, how are wealthy people always so influential? I think that's a really interesting question and I'm glad that the AI gave it to me. I didn't like the other questions that much because they weren't that interesting to me. Talking to her in class today, she said that might be one of her TED talks, right? Now they're just in the beginning, they don't have to finish their TED talks to June, but there were a lot of kids that, like this is another student, I have it online here, I'm on my phone. She said, I love the third inquiry question because it's something I truly wonder about. This really organized my thoughts neatly into different categories, which makes it makes it a lot makes it make a lot of sense to me as I read it. And it shows me the things I haven't even known that I have talked about, like the influence of popularity, etc. I didn't realize that I cared about so many topics in my life. And I feel like AI has defined it for me. And now it's giving me a clear path to my TED talk. So I was trying to use it like I don't, every time they read something, I just want them to be able to think about it, not just, you know, they only have one person, one mind. I keep saying we, we need lots of minds to stretch our thinking. I'm, I want, I want to bring up a, I love seeing the student things, but um, student responses. I want to bring up an issue that um, Jill and I need to figure out, which is how can we see all this stuff? Um, uh, the um, which we're, we're we're getting some resolution to, but do you? Let me just try to share for a second. If I share, we'll turn yours off. I think it may. I turned okay. myself off. Okay, okay. Present. Yeah. Right. So this is the list of the thinking partners that were created by your students in the last two days. Do you know this? <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> they kind of went crazy. So just just in terms of of how this works, right? Um, uh, so that um, when, a, when a student creates a thinking partner, they can see it themselves and Jill can see it and I can see it, um, but nobody else can see it yet. And then Jill, the, something you and I should talk about is you can go in and decide, okay, this one is ready for all of the students in at, at, at our school to see or in our group to see, right? And then at some point, Sam, and Sam is one example, Sam said to me today, when do I get to make it public so that everybody can use it, right? So he's created one, he's ready to, to make his public. And at that point, then I check off that it's public and, it, and it's good. So it's like a, a, a slow release process, but I'm, 
I'm totally interested in what they're learning by this process. Do you have any thoughts about how did you tell them to go ahead and make thinking partners? Um, well, I knew from you a little bit. And then because in Sam and Nate taught me and taught the class real mm -hmm. quick, and it was because of the first feedback we were getting, we realized we had to try to see if we could get it into simpler language. Um, and then it was so easy because the kids knew how to do it and they realized the prompt and then everybody wanted to do it. So what's fascinating is them really thinking about what, how much you can put into it, into the prompt so that you get what you want out of it. Um, and I, I think that's something that they could always play around with and, you know, a whole course could be on that alone. Yeah. So, I mean, so that's one of my questions is how are you going to make room for this? <laughs> um, you know, just little by little, I'm going to, each time we do the different projects and do different things, um, I'd love to come back. You know, it's funny because in my school, I'm not, I'm not following the curriculum of the other language arts teachers. And today I was in the meeting, they're going to try to use perplexity or something. Um, mm -hmm. And the kids are going to have to create the question and, you know, that's one of the problems always, even kids even going out on Google and not knowing what to ask. So um, I said, wow, I wish you could all be in, you know, had access to these thinking partners because kids could come together, I think, as groups and think about what do we want the partner to do? And I think more than just one person, but maybe groups of three, four and five kids together thinking and then trying the partner would be interesting. Mm -hmm. But I do think that, um, you know, they, if they've only just barely, right now, some of them are playing with it. Like their kids were playing around with the different, you know, oh, you could answer, have it be in somebody's, um, you know, voice or in their personality. We kept talking about it. Does it have a head and a heart? And what what kind of head and brain do we want it to have? But what kind of heart do we want it to have? But I, I don't know, Paul, this, it's a, it's a huge. I'm still here by the, my camera went off, but I'm still, what? Yeah, go it's, ahead. It's no, it's a, it's a huge opportunity. I mean, for, for kids to play with this, I think we'll play with it all year. So this is the, uh, the, the young woman, the, the eighth grader who created a, um, she created a debate expansion partner. Wasn't your assignment at all, was it? No. Is she, is she in a debate club or? You know? Yeah, it's he and he is. Okay. Oh, it's a he. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um so you no, know, he was because he, wrote, he he was so excited, he walked in this morning and he said, Can mm -hmm. I can I jump on in homeroom? Can I create this partner? I said, Okay, go for it. All right. So Bit of a mess, but we're making progress here. Thoughts, questions? <laughs> Let's have some conversation about what's going on here. I'm curious um, what people yeah. think about that, the thinking partner versus, okay, why couldn't I put all of those thoughts into chat GPT and would it, you know, kick back the same? Do your students ask that too? Um, I don't know. Right now, the I honestly think they don't know enough about it. Yeah, okay. I don't think they know enough about it. I think they like the idea of, you know, they already go into these the thinking partners for other assignments, for other classes. Did they hear other teachers telling me about that already? Um, but I, yeah. I personally think it's great. Thanks. <laughs> I'm I'm kind of curious about um, and and I guess maybe because we're I'm I'm back, but it's like, how did you explicitly teach your eighth graders about the prompts and how to create the prompts to give to the GPT? Like what I, what that process might have been? I only showed them that I I just the one day I just said to them, the thinking partner 
is a person. How do we want this person to read our work, read our book thought journals, and what do we want back? So I just did, I had mine up on the board on the projector and I knew from Paul's, I took one of his partners and I said, okay, let's read what's in that. All right, I'm going to edit it. I want, we want inquiry questions. Okay. We want to find out what our, I'm always talking about in topics. We want to know the real roots of the problems and issues. And we want to know all the branches because you never know which one you're going to be connected with. So we put that in and we were fiddling around together what's the wording we should put in. And then someone said, oh, make sure it talks in an eighth grade level vocabulary because it looks like it was too hard for us before. Great. Um, can you organize and identify specific themes and topics? So they changed that word identify. So we were just fiddling around so with it. collaboratively then, with them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then one or two kids would try it. And then they say, oh, I think you got to switch this. And I would click on the board on the projector and we would do that. Sam walked in this morning and he said, you know what? I think, I wonder if we fed it, don't talk like this. And you, and they had heard from you, Paul, that you have to speak in positives. So I said, oh, okay. All right. Maybe that's why we didn't, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't framed right. So, and then I just said to all of them, you can play with it, play with it. And, but I do think we would need a, you know, a couple of weeks just to play around and keep going at it but they are intrigued by it. And I, I think in this whole part of AI, I think them understanding how the thinking partner works and understanding how the prompting work is so it's equally as important as what we're getting back from the partner, because it's just, you know, it's what we would want them to do in any research is, is, is think about what they want and how they want to get that information. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. That's, uh, I saw, I did one, um, I did a, I went to NCTE um, in Columbus and they had a group there and they were doing kind of something similar, but, but it was where they were having, I think it was seniors come up with research questions through it. And so, and it was way, I almost wanted to email Paul and be like, you guys are like light years ahead of these guys. <laughs> so, but that's cool to just see kind of how you're um, scaffolding the kids to, to be able to ask the prompts and the importance of being able to do that, especially as we move into the future of where this is going to go. You know, I, I appreciate those words. I, I worry about the messiness and I, I, I and, and Jill, you need to help me feel okay with it. Um, <laughs> Like we now, you know, in their, in their, when they do their drop down, if you activate all of those for them, they're going to have, you know, 15 new GPTs in addition to the 50 we've created already. And like, how do they find their way in all of that uh, sort of forest? You know what? I am <laughs> yeah. a teacher that's, um, oh, I am okay with messiness. For me, I call, for us, it's play. So I said, listen, there are a lot of partners. Eventually, right, we have to think about how we want to name our partner because our partner's name should really be revealing of what it does. We're going to continue to play with what do we really want it to do. And we've done this before a couple of weeks ago with Paul where we took our 100-word narratives um, that we submitted to New York Times and we had it view them. And they, again, Paul kind of will show them one or two uh, thinking partners, and he's set up one specifically for the hundred word narrative, but the kids can't help but to just go off. I don't ultra control my class and that's what happens, right? L like in most classes, you know, the kids are still going to go off and they see all these other things and they just start to fiddle. And then they say, Hey, you know, you should try this one or you should try that. And even like Paul, when they were trying the different so in, really so like the, the communities. Guys. The community of the classroom is very important and they're talking to each other about it. Yeah. Yeah. I also think they have a lot of ownership. You know, my class is, uh, you know, I, I, I don't believe I'm not a great person. Everybody gets an automatic A it's about effort. So they really kind of get a zero or a hundred in my class. So I try to make it this, I, we're using this as a tool so that we can eventually say something back to the world in our TED Talks and in our podcasts. 
So it really is a tool for us to help us, help us stretch our thinking. And when we're writing something, we really want it to be a tool. None of them were tempted to steal the hundred word narrative, um, even when they went out to chat GPT and had it write it for them, write it for them. No one wanted to submit that one. All of them said the same thing. It's not my voice. It, it's dry. Oh, it wanted to put it in paragraphs. I want the one word set, you know, the one word paragraph. That was not the way I purposely set it up. So I think, you know, for me, I know it's key that, you know, students are writing and uh, reading about things that they care about and that all projects have an uh, audience and a purpose to them. And so, so yeah, those of you, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Jill. I, I just want to welcome those who are coming. Because we made this sudden, like earlier thing, I'm staying around for this hour and maybe talking to other people. But um, we'll close this off here. Um, and anybody with any further thoughts about what we should be thinking about or what what you've seen here tonight? And we're gonna get better at presenting stuff. I promise. <laughs> Paul, I have there, two yeah. thoughts. Do you yeah. mind? Do you mind if I jump in? Please shut me up. Uh, so. <laughs> I've been playing with kids on the prep and edit framework. Have you guys played with that at all with for prompting? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, <laughs> what, what is it again? Yeah, so there's this uh, prep and I'm gonna try and find it for you. And like, I don't understand how the chat works, but I'll at least email it to you, Paul. But um, the, it's Dan Fitzpatrick and Amanda Fox. They have this book called the AI Classroom. And mm -hmm. the money part of that book is the prep and edit framework. And it's like it, the prep part is how you prompt. And so it talks about exactly what Jill was saying about you have to set up the persona of what you're asking for. And then uh, each it's a mnemonic. And of course, I'm like really tired. So I'm not remembering all the little That's bits okay. and yeah, bobs yeah. of it. But yeah, it's it's been really <laughs> useful, like anchor for prompting because um, I think prompting is, it's really tough to explain what you want because there's so many nuances of human <laughs> communication of like how we pull things out of each other that um, then kind of go awry um, with AI. And then so, the, the other thought I was having, and so I was like really curious, but I do have to jump off because I have to be up at like really early tomorrow, um, is, I find AI writing quite boring, like just really, really boring. And so I'm wondering if the kids are feeling the same way. It kind of sounds like a deal. They're like, I don't want to use this hundred word thing. They didn't do it right. Um, I really struggle reading some of the output when it gets really long. And I just was wondering if anyone else <laughs> has experienced that. <laughs> So I think your two comments, if I could jump in on that, I, I, Joe, feel free, I, sorry. I think your two comments ma match each other. I think, and, and by the way, Joe, the, the notion that you could go to ChatGPT and get the same thing, I mean, we should, we all should be testing that, but in the way it is set up, you know, it, our, our thinking partners do not go through the ChatGPT, what's programmed in ChatGPT with that sort of boring language, right? Um, and so the better we get at making our prompts, the the, the stronger the language and, and stuff will come back. And then David, um, whenever we can start, you know, tuning what we get from the large language models, we can mess with that too. But I think it is all about the prompting. But every time the model changes, the, the the what the prompts do change so this is going to be an iterative process for a very long time i don't know how long and so i appreciate the you know the 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 outline but i also think that it's going to be that these prompts need to be made in community with each other looking at each other saying oh try that try this in addition to the the outlines that we can provide. Um, thank you, everybody who's leaving. And I appreciate, and we made this earlier so that those of you who go to bed at this time can do that. And anybody who wants to hang around, feel free. Um, I'm going to stop this recording. 
and um, then start again here. Don't go anywhere if you want to keep talking. Feel free.